Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Darkly reporting from Washington, D.C. First of all, a, um, a program note. My lecture on the Russian fleets of 1863 and how Tsar Alexander II helped Abraham Lincoln save the Union in that hour of dire peril. Uh, that uh, broadcast uh, was, of course, uh, put on uh, C-SPAN television in the past couple of weeks, but uh, it's now in the running on the C-SPAN website. That is to say, uh, C-SPAN uh, video.org. Anyway, you just go to C-SPAN and you, you get to it. Um, the C-SPAN video library. And if you just scroll down a little bit, you'll see that we have the uh, most watched programs of uh, recent days. And I'm very happy to say that uh, the speech that I gave at the National Press Club on September 24th, Russia's participation in the U.S. Uh, Civil War is now available there as number eight, the eighth most popular of all of the, mo the most watched. In other words, of the, of the people now going to the C-SPAN website, I believe, yes, the website, it is the eighth most popular. It is the most popular of anything appearing on C-SPAN 3. And it, uh, the only other historical one is one about Mamie Eisenhower, which counts as a C-SPAN special. So uh, I thank all of you who have uh, clicked in there and helped to project this up to the eighth position. And I ask you now, if you have a minute during the weekend, go to C-SPAN, go to the C-SPAN video library, take a look at the most watched, click over to the second set of those, and you will see uh, that uh, my talk is there, number eight. Just uh, click on it, watch it, review it, rehear it if you have time. And this I ask because it would be highly advisable for this to be rebroadcast, uh, especially to dissipate the unfortunate effect of the Perino study, right? The Perino study of Lincoln, which. Um, does not accord the necessary emphasis to the critical Russian alliance, which is what made Lincoln's victory in the Civil War possible. Without that, you would have had Britain and France coming in on the side of the Confederacy in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, slavery, most likely, would have dominated in at least much of the Western Hemisphere, certainly from the Mason-Dixon line to the South Pole, that would likely have been all slave uh, at the, uh, you know, by about 1870. So that didn't happen thanks to the, to the Russian fleet. So Russia's participation, if you want to just go to C-SPAN, click on Tarpley, and then look for Russia, you can get, you can get the same thing. So uh, that's uh, C-SPAN. That's um, uh, a light here, uh, in uh, in this uh, un unfortunate overall situation, although we've got now some uh, positive news: the U.S. election, uh, obviously a very mixed bag. How could it be otherwise? But uh, positive results to be sure. First of all, this is we're now referring to all the the mayoral elections, the Virginia, New Jersey elections, the New York City elections. And so forth. First thing we can say is the Tea Party has been repudiated everywhere. All important races, the Tea Party has lost. The only possible exception is Attorney General in Virginia, which is now locked in a too close to call recount. There, the Tea Party fanatic, the social bigot, Obenshein, uh, had a big lead early in the evening, but it didn't last. And as the Northern Virginia suburbs came in, it became neck and neck, and it's now a virtual tie. There will be a recount that may take weeks or even months before the winner is known. So as of tonight, as of today, we can say 
The Tea Party fanatics were turned back everywhere. They were repudiated. They were rebuffed. They were routed. The other thing we can say is that there is a definite left turn in mass psychology. We'll go through this in a minute, but when we get a trade unionist in Boston, an ultra-left in New York, a Clintonista in uh, Virginia, and so on down the line, apart from the hideous features of some of these individuals, to be sure, uh, that's a left turn. In other words, it means that the forces of reaction, the Koch brothers, the National Rifle Association, uh, the uh, dement or dement machine, the forces of Cruz, and so forth, the, the so-called libertarians, the reactionaries of Rand Paul and Ron Paul, all of them are defeated and in disarray. In particular, inside the Republican Party, we've now got open war, and it's this four-way division of the Republicans. You'll, you know, you'll recall it now. The legions of greed, the Wall Street and corporate money men, the social bigots, they like to call themselves Christian evangelicals. I don't see anything Christian uh, about them. Uh, the, the warmongers, the neocons, and then the libertarians, obviously starting with the stoners, right, the people interested in narcotics, but then getting into this very ugly right-wing anarchist anti-government phenomenon that we've seen uh, in the government shutdown and the attempt to bankrupt the United States with the debt ceiling, there's now war among these. And in particular, it's that the legions of greed look at the libertarian anarchists and say, you almost bankrupted my uh, predatory derivatives interests, right? If you had pulled your shenanigans with the debt ceiling and bankrupted the United States, I'd be wearing a barrel because I would have lost on all my shorts and my longs and and that would have been an upheaval. So the legions of greed look at these right-wing anarchists of the Cruz, Dement, and related types, Amash, whatever his name is, Rand Paul even, they, they look at them as a, an existential threat. In other words, they're, they're destroying the racket of these predatory money men. And, and there's, no, there's not much to choose between them, is there? They're both forces of... Uh, of chaos, perhaps the the anarchists, the chaos element is a little bit more immediate. The other thing is that the legions of greed are not happy with the social bigots. Uh, this came to the fore in Virginia. The the money people in Northern Virginia and elsewhere looked at Cucinelli, Cucinelli, social bigot, and said, "Look, uh, you know, you're going to be running around worrying about." abortion and gays and contraception and uh, other issues. We don't care about that. Those are rube-based. That's to get the yokels on board, but that's not really what we're about. We're about union-busting, tax cuts for the rich, deregulation, and so forth. And they look at Cucinelli, and they say, your, your record is wanting. You've wasted too much time on the rube-bait. In other words, you've somehow got become confused. The rube-bait is the cover story for the uh, reactionary union busting and related uh, policies. It's not uh, a goal in itself. So uh, a lot of them refuse to give money to Cucinelli. He goes down to defeat, and uh, this was um, a rather interesting result. Now, the other thing, so this means the Republican Party in big trouble, because if that, if that four-way alliance can't be maintained, the Republicans collapse. They've got to have the money element and the social bigot element. The social bigots are their ground troops. If they don't have them, then they can't uh, win elections. The warmongers, not enough. The stoners and anarchists, also not enough. So it's very definitely a tremendous crisis for the Republican Party. Could lead to their destruction. We'll be watching. Back in a minute. Welcome back to One Country Radio. As you once again, kindly please go to C-SPAN uh, website on the Internet. Uh, click on, uh, well, feed in uh, Tarpley, Russia, and you will get to this uh, speech of mine from the Press Club, t- 24th of September, about the Russian fleets. Click on that. Watch it for a while. It's now number eight. 
in uh, overall popularity on the website, and uh, if it goes higher, a good chance it might get uh, rebroadcast to the uh, to be able to refute the, I think, distorted picture that's being offered by Perino and certainly other um, existing uh, portrayals of these events on uh, on C-SPAN. So the Brand X history needs to be uh, countered. So please uh, don't forget that. So uh, repudiation of the Tea Party. Tea Party defeated everywhere. Left turn in mass psychology. Now, I'd be the first one to say, look at de Blasio in New York, right? Uh, this is not this is not a real step forward. It's a faker who operates under left cover and more more explicit left cover by far than Obama ever did. Right? By way 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 over uh, left, but of course a faker controlled by Soros, Gordon, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, uh, you name it. But to the average person, this is a left turn. So certainly E.J. Dion in the Washington Post of yesterday. A nudge to the left. The center of gravity in American politics moved left in Tuesday's off-year election. No doubt about it. And in terms of mass psychology, certainly uh, that's true. The reactionary Republican machine is crumbling. The legions of greed are at war with the libertarian stoner anarchist faction who want to destroy the government. And in another fundamental way, the legions of greed are at war with the social bigots who don't want to pay enough attention to the money needs of the money men. They want to go out chasing their ideological chimeras about homosexuality and uh, abortion, right? Guns, God, guns, God, gays, and abortion, right? Those great wedge issues, that's what they are. Uh, that's that's what those guys want to do. The money men say, no, 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 pay attention to our money needs. So that can blow them up, and we're hoping that this will now play itself out. There's a, Already, it's like the German army in 1918, uh, there's a stab-in-the-back legend among the uh, Cucinelli reactionary uh, Tea Party supporters. They say, oh, the money men let us down. They should have given us more money. We could have won. Uh, dubious, dubious, right? This is the uh, the Virginia Republican Party who ran what can only be described as a war on women. We'll try to get to that in a minute. Now, there are also, uh, well, the, the other, of course, the big thing, the tax Wall Street Party is on the map. Randy Credico, the tax Wall Street Party in New York City went all the way to November got 12,000 votes back in uh, on September 10th in the Democratic Party primary. This time, of course, it's more difficult to get people to, to experiment with a protest vote when they're facing this ogre Lota. Lota scared a lot of people, right? The prospect of another four years of dictatorship of finance capital, as we've had it under Giuliani and then under Bloomberg. That was scary. So Credico was cut down to about 650, 670 votes. But if you notice, he defeated five other candidates uh, who were on the ballot, and he just about tied the Socialist Workers' Party. And the Socialist Workers' Party has been there for 75 years, right? Since 1938, there's been the SWP, right? The Trotskyists of the fourth. International, and they were just slightly ahead of uh, Credico. So this adds up to programmatically planting the flag, making the point. Tax Wall Street Party is here. He was going with a one half of one percent tax on stock, bond, and above all, derivative turnover. This would have more than doubled the city's income, made possible the entire. Uh, social reform program that uh, that De Blasio talked about, but cannot will not deliver. We'll just we're bracing ourselves already for the first uh, betrayals by by De Blasio. The other thing now is in terms of this um, uh, this overall shift, there's now a bifurcation becoming visible in the Democratic Party, and this is exactly what I told you to look for. The goal is destroy the reactionary Republicans in place. 
play upon the division between the traditional reactionaries and the outright fascists, right? The fascists are the ones who want to destroy the government, bankrupt the government, and so forth. The outright, the reactionaries, of course, would be the money men who simply want to continue their racket while increasing their take. Uh, One interesting fact, the new mayor of Boston, Martin Walsh, is a crat. He's a trade union bureaucrat. So uh, here we see the, here's the coverage from the Washington Post also on Thursday. Voters in New York City and Boston on Tuesday chose two Democratic mayoral candidates who represent archetypes of the party's activist government labor-dominated past. Well, maybe the world, you know, has gotten old and now it's becoming young again. Both mayors-elect ran on a platform of economic opportunity and fairness, an issue that resonates more among Democrats at a national level in the wake of the Great Recession. New York's Bill de Blasio and Boston's Martin Walsh share a strain of economic populism with some of the party's more liberal members in Washington, like Senators Elizabeth Warren, D. Mass, and Sherrod Brown, D. Ohio. You get the idea. They're looking at something different. Populist pro-labor Dems. Notice, this is not the Democratic Party of Wall Street servant Obama, not the party of Schumer, New York Senator not the party of Durbin, and so on down the line, right? It's not the plutocratic Wall Street corporate wing. No. You can see already the fault lines, the fissures. Destroy the Republican Party, and the Democratic Party flies apart. That's the goal. That's the only way I see out of a historical blind alley, which is otherwise quite tragic uh, for this country, and for the world, and of course, we don't have it. What do we have? We don't have resources. We, we're lucky if we have car fare on some days, but <clears throat> we can still do it because you're, what you're trying to do is catalyze the movements, use the power of ideas to catalyze the movements of masses in motion and large institutions. Uh, just adjust them a couple of degrees because you're not telling them to do something that they uh, don't want to do. You're actually you're trying to get them to do things they say they want to do, but in, in effect, uh, do not do. So, number one, destroy the Republican Party in place. Number two, promote the split of the Democrats into populist pro-labor on the one side, plutocratic pro-Wall Street on the other. And we're going into a 2015 upsurge. As I predicted in June of this year at the New York Left Forum, the seven-year itch, an upsurge is coming in 2014-2015. We have it from the New Statesman of London. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Welcome to the here in Washington, D.C. I hope I footnoted everything. Uh, I was quoting there from the uh, the Washington Post of Thursday, November 7, 2013. I don't want to be a plagiarist like Rand Paul. Uh, It looks like... uh, his pal there, the Southern Avenger, had been uh, larding some of his books with some uh, some quotes that had been uh, lifted from various places. But of course, Little Rand won't won't fire any of those people. He's already had to fire two people for uh, for being too close to the uh, what can we say white supremacist uh, wing of things. All right, let's look at some of these interesting details. Uh, Boston, we basically said it. Um, the new mayor of Boston is a trade union official. He's is Guy Walsh. He's pledged to a $15 minimum wage in the city of Boston. How about that? Now, de Blasio, we, we've gone through this. We paid attention to New York City. De Blasio is a creature of Soros, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. Interestingly enough, de Blasio's family is a CIA family. De Blasio's uncle was some kind of a professor who uh, was assigned to uh, handle the Shah of Iran. I think he co-wrote or ghost-wrote a book for the Shah. His father also uh, up to his neck in, uh, in the intelligence uh, community. So uh, he is a, uh, somebody who, uh, a faker who operates under, under left cover. His real name is Warren Wilhelm. There's a little town, Sant'Agata, in uh, Italy that uh, now thinks that they've got 
a, uh, a scion who's the mayor of New York. Unfortunately, it's Warren Wilhelm. So he, uh, he's really not uh, what even the name says, right? He's like Herbert Fromm, Billy Brandt, or Gary Hartpent. <laughs> Gary Hart. Um, you get the idea. It's only a question of time before de Blasio begins attacking his own base. He never promised to end stop and frisk. Never. And that was then brought up, right, after the, after the fact. His uh, pre-K tax is chicken feed. It won't even be levied on a lot of the millionaires who winter in Palm Beach and, uh, or, or sorry, summer in, in the Caribbean and then winter in New York or whatever, however the hell they do it. Um, so uh, it's only a question of time, right? And remember, de Blasio came out and told the business community, I am a fiscal conservative. So he's a faker, but of course, he's, he's got to be a chameleon and look like a, he operates under left cover. Across the river in Jersey, here we have this Damon Runyon character, right? A goon, a thug. The, the media are groveling and propitiating this clown Unbelievably, right? He's now, you know, he's like, um, they, they're determined not to present him for what he is. He's not a moderate. He's a union buster. His first effort was to try to destroy the teachers' union and completely bust them and bust up the public employees. Uh, he also vetoed a bill to raise the minimum wage in New Jersey to $8.50 an hour. Boston is headed for $15 an hour. This bum, Christie, says, no, no, eight fifty is too much. I'm vetoing it. Now, that was overridden with a ballot issue in this precise um, election that we've just had. 60-40, the same, the same uh, arithmetic of the Kasich loss on his union-busting stuff in Ohio a couple of years ago. So... Uh, the other one, the unforgivable thing, right? You figure, oh, Republican, he's going to be a union buster. He's going to be a wage gouger for sure. He's a Republican. How about building the tunnel under the Hudson River? You want development. You want jobs. You want business. You want pork. You want a rake off. Sure, but not, not Christie. In order to pander to the reactionary Tea Party, he said, no, no, no. We're not going to build it. There was federal money. He refused federal money. So he, took, he looks like he took federal money on the Medicare expansion. Uh, thank God for small mercies. But he, he torpedoed, he destroyed this absolutely necessary new tunnel under the Hudson River. That's just unforgivable. The media are groveling for this thug. Notice also that the election he just had was a designer election. He organized two weeks earlier, he organized the by-election, the special election to replace Senator Lautenberg, who had died in office. So there was a, an election two weeks ago for Democrats and the black community. That was Cory Booker, mayor of Newark, getting elected senator. The, the left-wingers turned out for that one. And now this one was considered the one this week. This was an election for re reactionary Republicans, and that was, uh, that was for Christie. So when they say the Latinos voted for Christie, it means... The tiny portion of the Latino community that chose to come out in this second election, right, much reduced, I'm sure, compared to the first one, they voted for Christie. So he stacked the deck by having two elections, a designer election, one election designed to attract Democrats, the second election designed to attract his uh, reactionary Republicans. So this guy is a fraud. He's a Potemkin candidate. And, of course, uh, New Jersey, the Garden State answer to Hermann Göring, Reichsmarschall, head of the Luftwaffe in, uh, in World War II. And the idea is that he's, he's supposed to be an austerity enforcer, right? He's going to bully you and goon you and thug you until you quit. He likes to pick on women. Uh, he's a bully. Scratch a bully. You're going to find a coward. He's dirty as all hell. We now have this book uh, from... Um, the two uh, authors, uh, Halperin and Heilemann, why did Mitt Romney not pick this goon to be vice presidential candidate? Because Christie was a running dog for Bernie Madoff. He was a lobbyist for the trade association of which Bernie Madoff was president, and Christie's job was to convince the New Jersey legislature in Trenton that there should be no financial watchdog agency looking at financial fraud precisely the type that Bernie Madoff was uh, practicing. So this guy 
runs interference for Wall Street. He's a running dog, a goon for these predators, derivatives, mongers, hedge fund hyenas, uh, and all the rest. And there are other stories about his uh, excessive spending, his first-class flights, you know, feeding on the public trough, and all of that. Then we get to Virginia, and of course here it's the Republican Party, right, of Bob McDonnell. Now that the election is over, Bob McDonnell, the current Republican governor, may well be indicted on bribery, gifts that he, that he took from uh, a businessman. This, unfortunately, this cannot be described other than this is the, the Republican Party that wanted to impose a transvaginal ultrasound on women who wanted uh, to get an abortion. And Cuccinelli, Cuccinelli was out in front on all of those. So Cuccinelli, a vindictive, narrow-minded, nasty, social bigot. And, of course, running against him, the genial Terry McAuliffe, right? A picaresque thief, uh, a prince of thieves. Now that uh, Bob Strauss of the Democratic National Committee is no longer with us, I think the title of Prince of Thieves may well go to Terry McAuliffe, but genial, sunny. He challenged the National Rifle Association, defeated them. The lieutenant governor uh, was a Jeremiah. The Republican candidate, a black preacher with uh, all kinds of strange ideas, uh, the Democrats won that one. And as I say, the only one left over is the attorney general. Alabama, the, the Tea Party defeated in Alabama between Bradley Byrne, uh, the winner, mod- well, a, a reactionary, and Dean Young, a real extremist. Right. So um, you get the idea. It's a, a pattern now. If you listen to uh, Terry McCliff's acceptance speech, victory speech, you'll now know that I was right last time. The Hillary Clinton line is common ground bipartisanship. In other words, Hillary is now reverting to the pathetic line of Obama in 2008. I can be bipartisan. I can overcome the bipartisan divide. I can work across the aisle. We don't want that. We want the Republican Party destroyed. Hey, Democrats, you were telling us until yesterday that they're extremists, that they're fanatics, that they're anarchists. They're all that. And then you want to turn around and say, and we're going to we're going to we're going to haggle away your economic rights, Social Security and Medicare in order to please these bums and allow them to continue on. Sorry, no common ground. Destroy these reactionaries. Don't send them lifelines by compromise. Back. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley in Washington, D.C. Now, changing gears, we want to continue our coverage that we've been doing in the last several weeks on the very important, I think, world-changing visit, the North American tour of Sister Agnès Mariam of the Cross from that uh, monastery of St. James in Kara, Syria. And people will remember, I got to know Sister Agnes Mariam, uh, about two years ago, November 2011, when she uh, hosted an international delegation, including Thierry Maison of France and myself and uh, others from Italy, Belgium, many other countries, uh, to come there and see the truth of what was going on. And uh, she gave us uh, the proper uh, orientation to understand the truth of these matters. So Sister Agnes Mariam is now uh, in uh, the United States, and we wanted to get the first of what I hope will be weekly reports from Paul LaRudy of the Syria Solidarity Movement. This is where you can follow what Sister Agnes Mariam is doing. It's Syria Solidarity Movement on the Internet. There's a calendar there. Got to look a little bit to find it, but uh, be persistent. You're going to see that it's there, where she's going to be, uh, and, and what days. So I want to welcome uh, Paul LaRudy. And uh, ask him, can you bring us up to speed on uh, on what this tour is like? I believe she's been on the road in the U.S. for about a week now. Please, please tell yes. us everything. Yes, that's right, Webster. Thanks for inviting me on your show, and I'd be very happy to provide uh, weekly updates on what's happening. Um, <clears throat> um, I guess some of what's happened is expected, and, and some isn't. Um, we're trying to uh, provide uh, reports as much as we can get them from the venues that, about uh, what has happened. Uh, but I can tell you that the first two days, <coughs> she was...
was at the um, Tear Down the Walls conference in Tucson, Arizona, where she um, she uh, addressed the entire assembly of more than a thousand persons, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the first night, they invited her to be one of the key- keynote speakers, um, and uh, partly as a result of that, I guess her workshop was attended by more than 400 people. Uh, and they were very enthusiastic uh, about it. It was really a, an amazing uh, uh, event and reception uh, for her. Now, uh, admittedly, there were a couple of uh, maybe half a dozen uh, people from the Syrian American Council uh, which were opposed to having her speak in uh, North America or, frankly, anywhere else. Um, and on their website, <coughs> they uh, have put together a script and a petition, uh, petition, and the script is to be used by uh, anyone who wants to help them uh, shut down uh, Mother Agnes Mariam. You, you call the venue, and uh, you make... Uh, um, libelous and uh, false statements about about her and how terrible it is that this venue is is hosting her and uh, in other words you intimidate you uh, this is this is the idea get get as many right. people as possible to call and intimidate the venue and shut it down um, so there were about half a dozen of them there but. Uh, I have to say that the rest of the people there w- did not respond well to that, and uh, if anything, the rest of the people shut them down rather than uh, responding by shutting down. Let me ask you now, the, the Syrian American Council, I suppose that's the Free Syrian Army and uh, people like this. Uh, I, what I would wonder is, is, is there an element of, you know, you say intimidation, by these these would be censors, right, and and dictators of of public information and opinion, how far do they seem ready to go, right? Because we've seen what they do in Syria, right? They 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 stop at nothing, right? Are they threatening violence in the United States? Um, there may be one or two people. We actually had, <clears throat> I would say, probably only one person in the Bay Area uh, who. Uh, who actually threatened violence, and then later he more or less apologized. He he didn't actually commit any violence, as far as I know. Uh, I have to say that it we have tried to control the situation at the events a little bit, just be a little security conscious and uh, keep the um, uh, the format with, for example, written questions so that we don't allow someone up to, to make, uh, make a, a monologue that dominates the event and this kind of mm-hmm. thing. And that's worked quite, quite well so far. Uh, and some of the events have had nobody of that uh, from the Syrian American Council. But they almost invariably have made phone calls to the venues, uh, almost every single one. And they can go right to our website, as can you and your, your listeners, uh, to find that information there, and thank you for for uh, uh, suggesting that they go there. And it's these are open events. We uh, we we welcome them, uh, no matter how skeptical they are uh, at these events, to uh, to hear Mother Agnes and hopefully to give her talk a fair chance and to answer some of their questions and respond to their their concerns and criticism and all that sort of thing. But so far. I, I can't say that they have actually exercised uh, uh, violent options, and I'm certainly hopeful that that will remain the case. All right, just but we just want to remember, you know, who we're dealing with, right? What they do over sure. there, they may want to they want to do it someplace else. All right, so this was so far we've had the tear down the walls event in Tucson, Arizona. Has she gone on? Where is she now? And yeah. what does next she week look like? Actually. Yes, she's just actually finishing up in San Francisco, and it was a wonderful tour here here in San Francisco. We had a total of, I think, six events and an equal number of uh, in-studio or on-the-phone uh, uh, interviews. Uh, 
And so it's been uh, quite productive. Uh, uh, in the first event that she did in San Francisco, there were about 300 people attending. Uh, all of, most of the events have had larger numbers than were expected. I mean, 100 people at a retirement community, uh, that was that's the one of the largest uh, uh, attendances that they've had uh, um, in memory there. Mm-hmm. And so it's, uh, it's really good to see this. And um, I would say that last night was, relatively speaking, the most hostile audience that she's had yet. The, the, uh, uh, lots of her critics came uh, last night, but, but it was, it was done very respectfully in the end. And, and where was, where was uh, this located? Was this an institution, a campus? It was um, at the Oakland Peace Center, which is on the grounds of the First Christian Church in, in Oakland. The, the pastor got uh, one of those uh, people calling in, uh, saying that he should shut it down. And, um, and he, this, is, this is a pastor in uh, the middle of Oakland who's accustomed to this kind of thing, and he just... Uh, um, basically said, I don't have any time for this. <laughs> That's it. So I don't know if you can uh, anyway. if you can trace this back, but one of the one of the problems, of course, is that we have these so called um, leftists. Um, we have broadcasters. We have all kinds of people who claim to be, um, you know, anti war and they're interested in human rights, and they somehow manage right. then to get into a total. Uh, hostility to the existing government in Syria and and, and embrace these uh, extremist groups that obviously are not interested in in democracy, but they they somehow they they, they bring out this this, uh, this this hostility. You got to stay with us. I hope we got we've got a, a break for of sure. about four minutes for some uh, commercials, and then we'll be back in in a second. Can you stay? Sounds good. I'll Great. be around. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. It's a post-election broadcast, Friday the 8th of November. I'm inviting everybody to go to C-SPAN, take a look at my lecture on the Russian fleets of 1863, and maybe we'll get that broadcast on uh, C-SPAN 3 one of these uh, weekends to counteract the clouds of error that have been uh, spread by some Brand X historians. But now... We're going directly into the uh, the thick of the Syrian uh, issue. We're uh, very happy to continue to be joined by Paul LaRudy of the Syria Solidarity Movement. That's a website you can find. The sponsors, the organizers, in a general sense, of the North American tour of Sister Agnes Mariam of the Cross. Right, she is a um, she's the head of the uh, the certainly it's a, a Melkite Catholic. Uh, monastery convent in Kara, Syria, about halfway between Damascus and Homs. I know her, very fine person, true humanitarian, wants peace, reconciliation, and an end to this horrible civil war. So, um, Paul LaRudy, you're, you're telling us now this was, um, last night it was the Oakland Peace Center. Where does it go from here, and how can people get ready in the various places in the next week or ten days? Um... She will be flying to Southern California tomorrow, and there are events uh, tomorrow and Sunday in Southern California. Uh, She's going to be staying on in in Southern California for an additional two days for private meetings, and then she's flying on the, let me see, this is, yes, on the 13th, she's flying to Cleveland, uh, and they have a very full schedule, apparently, for her in Cleveland on the, the 14th and 15th, and there should be a lot of publicity because she's, the news media are really turning out for it. Uh, then on the 16th, she flies to uh, Denver, and they have an event that evening, um, the was it the Northwood Presbyterian Church? I think it is. Anyway, you can see it. You can find it at the calendar on online. 
Uh, and the following day, there's another event, and also, I believe, a uh, uh, an interview. I think it's a television interview. I'm not sure. Uh, and then that evening, she flies to Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, that's the 17th. On the 18th, she'll be she'll have some events in Lincoln, and on the 19th, she flies uh, to the UK. Well, actually, first to Toronto, and she catches a flight from there to uh, the UK, where she will be until the 30th including possibly a trip to Rome during that time to meet with uh, the, a delegation to the Pope. If you want to go um, through some of those locations in Britain, we have quite a few listeners uh, over in the U.K., so if you want to just tick them off, please do. Yeah, actually, I don't have that itinerary. It's the U- U.K. Organizing Committee that's doing that. I'd be happy to uh, put you in touch uh, with them. But okay. the... Uh, um, but anyway, she'll be coming. She'll be flying back to Toronto on the 30th of November, and her first event is on December 1st there. And she'll have about five days of events in Canada, and then uh, on the 6th and 7th of uh, December, she will be in New York City, and we expect. Uh, a very full schedule and uh, lots of stuff going on in New York and probably some large crowds as well. And then uh, she flies into Washington on the 8th. We don't yet have a uh, an event on the uh, <laughs> evening of the 8th, eight, uh, but uh, we, Monday and Tuesday we're going to get as many visits as possible to the Hill and, and possibly other governmental contacts. While she's there, right now I'm I'm interested in the, in the the last part because I can I can help you with uh, with quite a bit of that right and you want to obviously maximize the number yeah. of uh, congressional appointments right and you got to look in in some strange quarters right you're going to be surprised sure. the people that are going to be interested right not all um, you know of, of one stripe or another but certainly here if you're going to come to Washington D.C. you've got to have an event at the national press club and we press can certainly club, yeah. work on that and then um we've also got you know there is an activist community here washington dc is unlike some other places right politics here is a business people do it for money right there are a lot of mercenaries right. but there are also people who are concerned with you know idealistic humanitarian uh issues of of peace and 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 so forth so i think i'm in touch with a lot of those so I hope we can uh, we can work together because we, I think we can uh, we can we can fill that that part uh, out. And indeed, between New sense. York and Washington, I think you know national media, network television, uh, big cable uh, television should be should be highly interested. Right? The State Department obviously is not happy, but uh, they don't rule the world either. So uh, we'll push ahead. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, hoping that the events, the preceding events, will build to a kind of crescendo at that point, and then then she'll she'll have better access, and there'll be demand for her, and so forth. Um, so anyway, but that's her last stop in the U.S., and she'll be leaving on the 11th to go back to Lebanon. I fully expect that uh, there, you know, it's very likely that there'll be another tour. Um, in the new year, perhaps in the spring, uh, because so already we've uh, the demand is uh, uh, outstripping her uh, current schedule. Good. I would recommend to people, um, there's an interview of Sister Agnes Mariam with uh, Peter Phillips and Mickey Huff of the Project Censored. You have that on your website, right? Syrian Solidarity That's Movement. Correct. And there, in about half an hour, you get a summary of, of um, the analysis, at least the, the general outlines of what, what she has to say. And I think that's, that's something that uh, certainly deserves to be heard. We here have tried very hard to put out her, um, her study, right? The, the detailed yes. refutation of the faked or manipulated videos that were used after uh August 21st to try to start a general war uh and thank goodness that that uh that fell through but in the time we have left 
Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the Syrian Solidarity Network and how you came to this? Um, last night, one of the skeptics, uh, one of the questions was uh, about how our, uh, um, where our income is coming from for, for the trip. And I should say that uh, this is entirely a grassroots uh, operation. Uh, the money came uh, on by asking every event to chip in to the overseas costs and the shared costs, uh, and then to fully fund the, the local costs, including the airfare to the city where they're flying. So this was entirely funded, funded uh, locally, and typically they weren't even out of pocket on it because uh, they're getting reimbursed by passing the hat at the events themselves, and it covers it. So, um, so anyway, to dispel that. Now, about the, where this started was um, with the, uh, uh, you know conferences and 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 things that happened last year that got us in touch with uh, Syrian nonviolent groups and so forth, uh, and a delegation was created to go to Syria last August, then, um, and I was asked to invite Maria McGuire, and I did. She turned us down at that time, but that was because she was already working on another de delegation with Mother Agnes Mariam, and she uh, was putting together this delegation, and she, I was one of the people that was invited to go on it. So it was supposed to take place in February, but uh, we went in May, and uh, out of that came the impetus for this uh, this movement and to bring Mother Agnes's message here. You can just hang on one second. The music is our hard break. We'll just get a couple of more minutes in the next segment if you can hang on, and then uh, we'll let you go. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Just a couple of more minutes with Paul LaRudy of the Syria Solidarity Movement. They are, generally speaking, uh, coordinating, I guess we can say, the visit by Sister uh, Mother Agnès Mariam de la Croix from uh, the Monastery of St. James in Cara, uh, Syria. And she, of course, is one of the, perhaps the leading world humanitarian uh, Irenic spokespersons looking for a, um, a, a concord, right, looking for um, a policy of... Uh, 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 political solution through negotiation. It's the Masala movement. Can you tell us a couple of words about that? Um, yes. In fact, uh, she does not describe it as political. She describes it, it as non-political. Okay. Because it is, it is on the basis of reconciliation among anybody who's fighting with each other. Um, and uh, but it is a, a Syrian movement, and uh, it rejects the interference uh, of uh, foreign powers uh, or foreigners in general to uh, in the process. And uh, you can see on our website for an example of a success in in this in Muadamiya, uh, where they evacuated. Uh, 7,000 uh, really suffering refugees through a negotiation that uh, she personally uh, made uh, between hardline, uh, you can call them uh, affiliates of Al-Qaeda, uh, some of them, uh, and the uh, Syrian government. And the remarkable thing was that they allowed her to come into their their headquarters and uh, uh, and talk with them, and it was very cordial. Uh, and and then on the way out, uh, they escorted them to the place where the army was, and there you had uh, soldiers and the these uh, hardcore rebels, uh, um, you know, conversing together, shaking hands, and uh, and uh, the soldiers offering offering them cigarettes and. Uh, so it's uh, this is what she's talking about. She she's often accused of being uh, pro Assad because she's not anti Assad, uh, and she does go into uh, Assad government the uh, you know 
Syrian government offices and for, for the purpose that she tries to maintain good relations with everybody. So this is, uh, and uh, she tries to solve problems, basically, is what it's about. And if this can grow uh, widely enough, she thinks that it could be a solution to the problem. All right, wonderful. I would just say that, there, that if you look on the Internet, you're going to find the wildest, most uh, un unbelievable charges against her. Uh, one of them, I think, is a guy by the name of Weiss, has uh, come up with a screed where he invents various um, various charges to hurl at Sister Agnes Mariam, and that, that guy is, uh, his track record is that he's a, he's a warmonger. He's a neocon. He's uh, concerned with the Israeli security needs, and uh, and this is how he how he expresses it. Let me just ask you one last thing now. Suppose I'm I'm interested, right? This the this, and yes, Mariam is a person of massive moral integrity and really world historical status. I often thought if Joan of Arc were here in our time, would look something like like Sister Agnes Mariam. I think so. If they want to help with the financing, if they want to aid your group, can you tell them how to get in touch with you? Uh, the simplest way is to go to the website. The, the donate page there has information about how to send it uh, by check or to do, donate directly uh, through the PayPal link that's there. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit so that um, all uh, donations are tax-exempt. So and also you can communicate with us through the website. So you're most welcome to do that. And All right, great. I hope people will do that because you know this is something that should be uh, should be essentially everywhere. Uh, it to counter it to counteract, frankly, the the very very distorted picture that we've had through the various media, the State Department, and indeed these left gatekeepers. Right, I, I have to mention uh, Amy Goodman of Democracy Now and people like this who uh, have really not. Uh, told the truth about what's going on in Syria. So let me thank Paul LaRudy. Can we get you back next week for an update? For sure. And once okay. again, that website is uh, SyriaSolidarityMovement.org. Okay, SyriaSolidarityMovement.org. And we look forward to hearing more uh, next week about uh, all the things going on in Los Angeles, I guess, and, and, uh, sure. and related parts. Thank you so much for coming on. Best of luck to Thank you, you and please give our, our best salutations to Sister Agnes Mariam. Will do. Thank you very much, Webster. Okay. See you soon then. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. So uh there you have it. That is um as I mentioned last week, right, we've got these these um stories that Saudi Arabia is so unhappy with the fact that uh, Obama did not bomb Syria, that Saudi Arabia is now getting set to do their own things. And what will that look like? They're going to give advanced uh, surface-to-air missiles to the death squads, right, to the Nusra al-Qaeda uh, cannibal forces inside Syria. And if they give these advanced uh, surface-to-air missiles, right, man pads, shoulder-held uh, devices, those can be used to bring down Syrian military aircraft, but also any kind of civilian airliner, be it Lebanese, Israeli, Turkish, um, Jordanian, you name it. And then when that happens, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be an attempt to blame that once again on Assad. So what we've got to do is recalibrate the outlook of people here in the uh, Western world. So this is the opportunity to inoculate people against various kinds of war provocations that are still coming in. By the way, we don't have time to do justice to this this week, but uh, right now Geneva, of course, very busy in Geneva. The uh, Saudis are freaking out. The Israelis are freaking out. Uh, the uh, It looks like the Perm 5 plus 1, that is the five permanent members, U.S., Britain, Russia, China, and um, France, plus one Germany, are getting close to some kind of a deal with Iran. And this would slow or freeze or somehow limit the progress of the Iranian uh, enrichment program of uranium, but it at the same time would uh, loosen or relax these killer economic sanctions. And this might be then the prelude to 
uh, a more uh, ample negotiation process. We've got to move the Middle East back from the brink of an all-out war. So uh, Kerry is there, Fabius is there, others are coming in. Netanyahu is freaking. He's on his own. The Saudis are freaking. They assembled the entire uh, cohort of Saudi princes. I guess there must be about 15 or 1,500 of them, 2,000 of them, to tell Kerry that they were not happy. So uh, they're also the Syrian peace talk. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Uh, the, one, the one thing uh, we would add to what we had to say about Geneva, right? The Geneva is uh, hot corner, the U.S.-Iranian or Perm 5 plus 1 Iranian uh, talks going on, and there's still the effort to get the Syrian uh, peace talks going. Russia has not given up on that. And the good news, Aleppo is now uh, quite possibly about to be liberated. A key town near Aleppo has been uh, retaken, liberated by the Syrian army and its allies, and uh, that may be the key to Aleppo. The death squads may be about to be driven out of Aleppo, and their reign of terror inside Aleppo may be uh, in its last throes. So let's now change gears again. Uh, I gave a quick summary of the New York uh, vote, right, the outcome of the Critico tax Wall Street Party campaign. We're very happy once again to have Daniela Walls with us. Daniela, we're under a little bit of time pressure. But in this segment, okay, well, which glad, we can, we can devote to you, can you give us a quick summary? What happened in New York, and what does it mean for the rest of the United States? Well, I'm glad you gave a rundown of what happened in New York. I can tell you a little bit more. But I, I wanted to start out by saying, um, you know, how we're still in the embryonic phase of this party. Um, and we're only a couple months old, and we're actually going to be making our debut in January of 2014. And um, that is when we are going to go national, and our candidates will announce their candidacies for Congress. We can't announce any candidates until January 2014. So now the party is still just in the rudimentary stages of building our foundation. At times, like it was in New York, it was treacherous running Randy in New York City without much organization or money and so quickly and right out of the gate. But it was a trial by fire, and uh, we got comfortable, Webster, with how the electoral legal process works. So these next couple months, we have time now to lay the foundation and go national. Um, next year is going to be our first real test because we'll have multiple candidates running in multiple jurisdictions. I'm not sure. Um, I, yeah, I wasn't sure if people knew how uh, knew all this stuff was. We just got our website up a few weeks before Tuesday's election in New York City. And we also built a couple weeks ago a social network for party founders. Uh, we need as many like-minded people and leaders to come aboard at this launching now. Um, and like you say, Webster, it's time for the leaders to come out of the closet. And, you know, instead of making hand signals in the park, this time make it legal. We need to make our way into this corrupt, corrupted system and uncorrupt it. People can organize a legal party branch in their state and help somebody run for office or run for office themselves. And this is what leadership is, doing everything against the system and bashing the system is sort of juvenile passe at this point. And I think it's time uh, for the right ideas to get in the system. Uh, we have also uh, we are also interested in alliances and coalitions. If you have an organization, but you need the component of a solid economic program, maybe to second what you are advocating, then please contact us at our website at taxwallstreetparty.org, and please take the time to read our platform again. Um, we are also Webster. I just wanted to say too, we are recruiting. Uh, we are currently recruiting candidates to run in the 2014 midterm elections for either statewide office, U.S. Congress, or uh, a state legislative seat. We have four or five strong prospects at the moment for Congress, U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. So if anyone has an interest or, or knows of anyone in your state or congressional district who would be interested in running on the Tax Wall Street Party, we would like to hear from you as soon as possible so we can develop a strategy for you to gain ballot access. In every state, ballot access requirements are different. There are different deadlines in every state. There are different dates when you can start petitioning and signature requirements vary from state to state. We also need to discuss uh, as soon as possible with potential candidates other uh, requirements such as how they are registered to vote. For instance, in some states you cannot be registered as a Democrat or Republican if you plan to run as a minor party candidate. 
Mm-hmm. By the end of this year, 2013, you would need to have switched. If you wait till January 7th, Webster, to switch your voter registration, the state will say you are ineligible to run on the tax Wall Street Party. There are also residency requirements. There's a lot of quirky rules regarding candidacy, so this is why it would be nice if candidates would get in touch with us now. And again, you can contact us through the website, taxwallstreetparty.org, or email uh, me at taxwallstreetparty at gmail. And, um, and the founder site is also very uh, important. We have programmers to help build us that social network as a place to discuss future strategies and plans. And the network includes individual state organizations so that members can discuss things relevant to the party with other members of their state. So email me uh, for an invitation. And then a little bit about what happened on Tuesday. In New York City, my uh, take on it is that the establishment won. <laughs> the establishment won big. Uh, you can make a pretty strong case that de Blasio is nothing uh, but the entire establishment, Webster. He's the real estate establishment, Wall Street, the SEIU. The establishment won, um, won on Tuesday. Nothing good really happened. It was but, of course, uh, he, since he has to operate under this left cover, it's just a mm-hmm. question of time before he begins to be perceived as attacking his own base. He's going to renege mm-hmm. on stop and frisk. He's going to act as the fiscal conservative that he, uh, he proclaimed himself to be. In other words, this is now very unstable. Right? Bloomberg was a reactionary. Everybody knew it. He's a Wall Street thug. Nothing new. Uh, this de Blasio is supposed to be the angel of progressive uh, renaissance in New York, and when it's clear that he's not, that sets the stage for a blow-up. It's not. He, it won't be long before he disappoints. The results were a little discouraging for all, this, all the third parties, uh, as their vote totals were lower than they've ever been before. Um, and this election was discouraging for every third party involved. I, I was looking at, I was even looking whether the city council races in New York, even the races where it was only one-on-one, like a Democrat with an independent, where the Republicans didn't field a, chemi- uh, a, a candidate, they got wiped out too. Meaning, uh, anyway, like uh, some in those cases, the independent would usually get at least ten, twenty, thirty percent. In this case, they were getting like one, two, and three uh, percent. Um, so Tuesday was all status quo. De Blasio, like you said, is not going to come in now and make any earth-shattering changes. And nothing new happened. De Blasio was expected to win. New York City is an overwhelmingly Democratic city because of. Bloomberg's wealth and, you know, New York City's high crime rate in the early 90s, that led to aberrations, Giuliani and Bloomberg, but nothing unusual happened in New York City on Election Day. It was, you know, solidly, solidly blue city, and they elected somebody who was like Obama in a lot of ways, unlike, you know, other Democratic candidates. He did need to be sold as more progressive, but as far as any implications when, it, when he begins to gather, govern, nothing's going to change. Wall Street is going to keep on the same as They've always kept on the final financial oligarch will be running everything. There isn't okay, but look, sort of let's change. let's also there's a bright side. Um, you look at this city, right? With all you know, it's ninety percent democratic or whatever it is. Still, the Democratic Party could not elect anybody after Dinkins in nineteen eighty nine. So we've had about a quarter century of the naked dictatorship of finance capital. Now we've gone to the camouflaged dictatorship of finance capital, and I would call that a minor step forward. In other words, I think it's a hopeful sign. It shows that you can't just uh, go with a straight, you know, reactionary in your face. It's got to be somebody who's uh, who's going to fake it. And if you look at, at uh, de Blasio's left cover compared to Obama's, de Blasio is way further left, right? Obama was a neoliberal, mm-hmm. bipartisan, all this other stuff, right? De Blasio is... Uh, having- substantially different. So having to camouflage it more and more, which is a good sign. Because right. when, the, when, when they can't go any further and it busts apart, then people are going to have to take a harder look at what's going we may, on. We may have a mass strike in New York City next spring. That's the, I think that's the, the working hypothesis. Well, that would be good, and we need to be there with the uh, Tax Wall Street Party. Exactly, to, with uh, program. And, and I think nobody let, else is going to bring yeah, program. Not let the... New, so should I, is that, is that, are we done today, Webster? Should I say goodbye? We can, we can give you a couple of more minutes if you have something of, of earth-shaking importance. Come back in a couple of seconds and, and give us okay. the contact information, and uh, we'll be moving on again next week. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. 
<laughs> Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. I realize this is now our last uh, segment. Daniela, why don't you just quickly give your contact information, people interested in the Founders' site, interested in exploring possibilities of running for office, how the uh, Tax Wall Street Party can help people to uh, realize their their political dreams, ambitions, and uh, and serve the country. <laughs> Okay, well, you can contact us through the website at taxwallstreetparty.org or email me directly at taxwallstreetparty at gmail. And if you want to be invited to the Founders Social Network, send me your email uh, at taxwallstreetparty at gmail, and I'll send you a personal invitation because it's an invite-only site. Uh, And uh, you were talking about the upsurge of a new Occupy at the end of 2014 that's being talked about. And uh, we were talking about, you know, who is going to dominate this? Is it going to be the Assange, the Snowdens, the Russell Brands, or finally a program? And right. our goal, or my aim, is to have Tax Wall Street Party step in almost where Occupy fell short, you know, offering our program at a party and a practical way to have our demands met by electing people. We have to do, you know, almost what the Tea Party did and make it into the political arena. Some of my friends think I'm naive to work within the system. They've gone that Occupy route where they think, you know, things are so far gone and that the whole thing needs to be scrapped and we need to invent a totally new system. And I spent a lot of time thinking that way, too, Webster, and I used to run around saying, you know, don't vote like Russell Brand just did. But I saw (laughs) that while I was busy, I did, I grew up, but I saw that while I was busy running around advocating for nothing, every other faction, Webster, I was against was busy taking power. So instead of voting... So instead of voting or not voting, there's a third option, which is to find a minor party candidate that you believe in, believe in and support them all the way. And remember, we've got to wrap up now, but the voting is the least oh, of it. Sorry. The voting is simply the prelude to intervening in a mass strike wave to provide leadership, program, organization, and direction so that you win, right? Mm-hmm. As we said, there's no uh, Occupy Wall Street faction in the House of Representatives or the Senate or governors or mayors is nothing. They got absolutely nothing for all the Sturm und Drang. They came up empty. The Tea Party is sitting there with seventy or eighty lunatics in the House of Representatives. This this right. kind of uh, asymmetry has to end. Anyway, thank you, Daniela. Well, we I have five run. candidates. We have five candidates coming up for Congress. Good, so and hopefully we'll on, have more. We'll, we'll see you, as Webster. we go into the hot stove league now. We'll we'll have more. Thank you so much, Daniela. Come back thank next week. Much, we'll Webster. have more time. We had to do uh, Sister Agnes Mariam today. Okay. Oh, wonderful. No problem. Bye-bye. See you soon. Thank you. Now, let me just, I just want to give you some headlines now because we're down to the last uh, minutes. Ron Paul gave the kiss of death to Cucinelli. Nullification. Remember, all that stuff with nullification, interposition, and secessionism is poison among patriotic Americans. And that's how the Federalist Party was destroyed in 1814, 1815. They flirted with secessionism. That was the end of them. I call your attention to the Roger Stone documentary Pandora's Secret, which was on CNN yesterday. This certainly shows the benighted ignorance, the hysteria of the uh, green anti-technology, anti-progress, anti-science mob. The portrait that they gave of Helen Caldecott, I think, captured her superficiality, her bluster, her profound ignorance, her rage and irascibility. Uh, the representative they had on there from the National Resources Defense Council was, uh, was pathetic. She said, this is not 1970s hysteria. That's exactly what it is. And the tragedy is that people have been dying in the third world for lack of uh, cheap, uh, abundant power. And don't tell us that that windmills and solar cells are going to do it. This is simply a bad joke. There's no, no, there's not enough land uh, on Earth to 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 go with those those things. So um, we also want to be aware, as I said, Aleppo about to be uh, liberated. Uh, and we, uh, Daniela mentioned this Russell Brand. Now this this character, this decadent individual, I, I knew very little of him, but we, what we see is the hyperactivity of British intelligence, right? We had Snowden, Assange, Greenwald, and now uh, they were getting a lot of publicity from The Guardian, of course, right? Notice Snowden, Assange, Greenwald, they told you nothing 
about the operations against Syria, nothing about the operations against Egypt or Libya, nothing about the Arab Spring, nothing about um, what was going on with the CIA backing the Muslim Brotherhood. Not, there was nothing about the Israelis. There are no ongoing operations that were blown by these so-called Snowden, uh, Assange revelations. And now we've got, instead of the Guardian, or competing with the Guardian to be the Pravda of the world revolution, we've now got the new statesman, ultra-left organ of the British uh, financial and spook community, and they're pushing this character, Russell Brand, who obviously he thinks he's a, he's a mixture of Che and uh, Jesus Christ. He's obviously a narcissist. And he's telling us about revolution, that it's revolutionary not to vote, but it's revolutionary to go for the total consciousness revolution. There's nothing more tired and hackneyed and shopworn than these idiotic slogans. All of them have been recycled from France, May 1968, when they were used by NATO to try to destabilize General de Gaulle and uh, open the way to bigger and better U.S. domination of uh, of Europe. And notice, when you get somebody of this ilk, right, somebody from the entertainment world, it's the situationist international. We can smell ad busters, this vaguely radical chic, vaguely pornographic, vaguely um, substance abusing uh, world, maybe not so vague, maybe more more explicit. So um, that's all going on. Remember, if you want to tell a limited hangout, uh, one of the big signs is the Damascus Road conversion of the person, right? that the person becomes an immediate celebrity. They do so when other whistleblowers are ignored, people who are coming with hotter and more important stuff. They don't get any traction. They tell you nothing new, and they tell you nothing about the big issues, nothing about the JFK assassination, 9-11, the Arab Spring, these other operations. And instead, they prepare more covert ops, right? Pentagon Papers prepare Watergate. Assange prepares the Arab Spring. What is Snowden preparing? An attempt to what? It was obviously to try to save the Syrian rebels, uh, to put the U.S. on a weak footing vis-a-vis Britain and France. And now Russell Brand, what is he uh, preparing? So all these things going on. And remember, as we pointed out at the beginning, we're going through these party realignments, right? There was a 1932 to 1968 New Deal phase. It was destroyed by the Vietnam War. There was a 1968 to 2008 reactionary phase, the Southern strategy, dominated by Southern states, veterans, old people, racists, uh, white men, rural, small town, petty bourgeois voters, neocons, Christian fundamentalists. That has blown up. That was blown up by the Iraq War and the crash of 2008. So now we're in the early phases of a new party realignment. But these, these structures take a while to, uh, to shift. So we're, uh, when you see things like the, uh, interestingly, in, in New York, right, the first time the Democrats have been able to elect a mayor since 1989, or the fact that in Virginia it's the first time since 1973, I believe, that the White House Party has also been able to win the governorship in, in Richmond. Or another one is it's the first time since the 1880s that a political party has not been able to hold the governorship in Virginia for two terms, at least, uh, in a row. So you're seeing all of these monumental events that are going by, and what it shows is that the old order of 1968 to 2008 is shifting. I would, I would say this um, Pandora's uh, secret, right, on CNN, right, an attempt now to return to uh, what amounts to science. In other words, to go back to the, the pre-1968 paradigm, science, technology, industry, progress, improvements in the cultural and material lot of, uh, of humanity... Uh, that, I think, is a step in the right direction. And the, the, the merciless exposure of the hypocrisy and stupidity and hysteria of these green spokesmen, I think, was a quite interesting feature. So, 
I guess that's all of our time for today. We'll see you next week. Uh, watch out for those food stamp cuts. They're hitting right in advance of Thanksgiving. That is a crime. We want to roll that stuff back, roll back the sequester, and we'll be fighting for that next week on World Crisis Radio.